festival where the rain is pouring outside but inside I'm joined by the multi-award winning screenwriter and producer Stephen Moffat. Together with the audience here we'll be looking at a career that began in 1989 with the children's TV drama Press Gang and sees him now completing a run as showrunner of Doctor Who. In between he's made three sitcoms, a modern version of Jekyll and Hyde, turned his back on Steven Spielberg and run two shows with a loyal international following, Sherlock as well as Doctor Who. His screenwriting has earned him a special award from BAFTA in 2012, and here is a flavour of some of those shows. The angels are coming for you, but listen, your life could depend on this. Don't blink. Look, would you mind just filling in the form? We need to know a bit about you. Yeah, well, you could try asking. We ask on the form. Do you always make friends by questionnaire? I'm not making friends. Women want somebody with command, with confidence. Somebody who won't take no for an answer. We want somebody arrogant and gorgeous, with a terrifying sexual appetite and an amazing range of sexual technique. But when it comes right down to it, do you know what? We'll settle for a man. Mr. McGill, I noticed a couple of broken windows on the ground floor. Punish a pupil, will you? Uh, which one? Uh, well, I don't know. Just pick on any boy with an earring. You're a teacher, for God's sake. Possible suicides. Four of them. There's no point sitting at home when there's finally something fun going on. Look at you all happy. It's not decent. Who cares about decent? The game, Mrs. Hudson, is on. Well, welcome to Front Row, Stephen Moffat. We heard in order there Doctor Who, Press Gang, Coupling, Chalk, and, of course, Sherlock. But I want to go back to the start. I gather Harry Seacombe and Songs of Praise played a role in your first script getting noticed. Yes, very, very central role. Um, You remember the show Highway, where uh, Harry Seacombe loomed around various schools, menacing schoolchildren with religious music. Um, He... uh, he turned up at my dad's school, and they were using uh, kids there for the, for the show. Because your dad was uh, a teacher. My, my dad's a, well, yes, my dad was a headmaster. And uh, my dad, knowing that I was desperate to become a theatre playwright, still not managed it, said, look, my, uh, I've got a brilliant idea for a, a children's television programme about a newspaper made by teenagers. Now, he didn't really. What he was doing was working on an education kit. It was about that. But, you know, he's an opportunist, my dad. So he went for it. And speedily, with the, the typical response time of television, two years later, the producer's girlfriend, Sandra Hasty phoned my, my dad up and said, look, I, again, typically television, I can't give you any money at all, but could I develop your idea? And my dad said yes to the no money. He's Scottish, we don't know better. And he, uh, he said, but I'd like my son to be involved in writing it. And uh, Sandra said, bless her, Absolutely not. Under no circumstances will that ever, ever happen. But I will read a sample script from him, reject it, and tell him why. So, with an offer like that, um, I wrote a script, and uh, as luck would have it, she had bad enough taste to really love it, so I ended up writing Press Gang. Wow. I'm being slightly grumpy about the fact I wasn't a successful theatre playwright, which I still, I still am, really. <laughs> well, let's it's have, a life of failure. <laughs> well, let's have a listen to Press Gang, you know, which ran from 1989 to 1993. In this episode, the Junior Gazette has just printed a special edition about how they saved the local community centre from closure, but it's turned out that it is going to close after all, and Linda, played by Julia Sawala, the editor, decides they have to change change the paper and reprint. OK, everyone, listen, please. We've got a problem. There's a lot of people out there who don't think we've a right to be doing this. There's a lot of people who don't seem to think our paper's worth staying up for. In fact, they all seem to think we should be home in bed like good little children. Oh. Which is why there's a whole load of parents on their way here to drag us back, tuck us in, and maybe read us a bedtime story. Oh. Well, they're not going to get away with it. No way. I've locked the doors. I love the extras. They're great. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> But, you know, <laughs> that show holds up so well. Not just, you know, particularly Julia's character, but the whole atmosphere of that programme and the sincerity of it. You were a novice writer, as you say, but you wrote every episode. Yes. What did you learn from making Press Gang? Oh, practically everything, because the tremendous advantage of doing something you, you don't understand or have no experience of is there are no limits on you. You don't know what you shouldn't do. So I just blundered around the entire place, doing pretty much exactly the same job I do now, because no one would stop me. Uh, You know, I'd go to the edit, I'd go to all the meetings, I'd go to the dub, I'd just get involved in everything. 
Well, Press Gang won a BAFTA, it won a Royal Television Society Award, but your next TV series was definitely not for children. Joking Apart, which ran from 93 to 95 on BBC Two, was very openly inspired by the breakdown of your first marriage. And you later worked on Coupling, a kind of ruder Friends, which was inspired by your happier second marriage. Here's a clip of them both. Now, what the hardest thing is on a first date? Well, the second hardest. <laughs> to mentioning sex. So what happened? OK. I'm there. Sally's there. Good start. Can't fault you. I've been through all that foreplay stuff, now I'm ready for the actual sex. OK. So, there I am, there we are, on the bed. Right, yeah. Runway in sight, final approach, would all passengers kindly fasten their seatbelts? <laughs> Barely were those words out of my mouth. <laughs> When I look down, and nothing's looking back. <laughs> uh, coupling and before that, uh, joking apart. In my defence, I spent a long time writing children's television, so I, I, I splurged into sitcom and wrote nothing but sex. Well, it, it is an interesting <laughs> move, isn't it? I mean, were you nervous about mining your own personal pain in those as well? I, I strangely wasn't, though I look back on it in horror. But yes, I'd been through a, a, a fairly unpleasant divorce, so naturally, I pitched it as a sitcom, and they said yes. So I, I, I mined my personal misery for several years after it had naturally expired. That's not a really good thing to do. Uh, and I in innovated the feel-bad comedy. Doesn't work. Doesn't work. Don't write feel-bad comedies. That's a stupid idea. But it was a good show, I think, but uh, nobody ever watched it because it just made you depressed about the state of your own relationship. <laughs> and then I became happy again and wrote the, uh, the feel-good comedy version Coupling. of it, which was uh, a lot more successful. But, of course, also, and you'd been doing it even in Press Gang to some extent, you, you were using flashbacks. Mm. Um, and the male lead in Joking Apart, Robert Bathurst's character, does these fantasy stand-up routines yes. where he kind of reminisces. I'm interested in how long you've been playing with format that way. When I watch telly or watch movies, I love all that stuff. I love a bit of non-linear storytelling. Gosh, there's a surprise. If I uh, read a review of something and it says, um, this is gimmicky and non-linear and a bit up itself, I think either I probably wrote that or I'd like to watch it. <laughs> Well, it was back to school for the sitcom In Between Joking Apart and Coupling, Chalk, which was broadcast on BBC One in 1997. At this time, the perspective of the struggling teachers and a sense of farce again, and particularly with it, the first series recorded in front of a studio audience. Here's a reminder featuring David Bamber as the deputy head. What do you want? Mr Slam from me at class, sir, for talking. But did he give you any work? No, sir. No, of course he didn't. Which class? Religious education. Fine. Sit there and make a plasticine model of God. <laughs> and you better get it right. Um, you, like your dad, were a teacher, as we yeah. said. But it, a lot of teachers really hated it. It was unfavorably... A lot of people really hated it. <laughs> and it was un unfavorably compared to Faulty Towers for yes. that sense of fast. <laughs> I'll tell you, the best joke in chalk isn't in chalk. It was somebody who'd identified that it was a bit like Faulty Towers except rubbish. And they headlined the review comparing chalk to Faulty Towers. Chalk and Cleese. Isn't that brilliant? <laughs> Better than any joke in the show I wrote, sadly. What did, what did you learn from the experience of making chalk then? Um, I think it was too nasty. It was unpleasant. There was nothing nice about it. There, it was an unpleasant place to be. It's like I said earlier about the Feel Bad sitcom, but it was worse than that. Nothing seemed real in it. Um, Eric Slat just did the wrong thing all the time because he was a character in a comedy. And that doesn't work. I mean, whereas Basil Fawlty, uh, I understand what his worldview is and, uh, and why guests get in the way of his desire to run the perfect hotel. It's a, it's a glorious conceit. It's brilliant. I know what Basil Fawlty wants, and I know why he's never going to get it. Whereas in Chalk, everyone was just doing funny things because, well, there's a studio audience over there, and we better get a reaction from them. On the nights of the show, we'd get tumultuous applause, fantastic laughter, and that would go out to Stone Cold Silence on BBC One and my mother telling people he was ill when he wrote it. <laughs> Seriously, she said that. I'm saying, Mum, I wasn't ill for two years. That's, that's, that's... Well, in 1999, you wrote a Doctor Who sketch for Comic Relief. Hey. At the time, Doctor Who had been off air for about a decade. You put a lot of famous actors in playing the Doctor, um, ending with a particularly delightful final regeneration. Doctor, we have to face facts. You've come back to life, and this time, you're a woman. Really? 
I've always wanted to get my hands on one of these. Unfortunately, I haven't. Your mother's going to get a bit of a surprise at the wedding, isn't she? Do you think we'll both wear white? I'm afraid, Doctor. And I'm not sure this sentence has ever been used so completely accurately before, but you're just not the man I fell in love with. Well, never mind. We can still rattle around the universe, fighting monsters and saving planets. What could be more fun? My best friend by my side, my trusty old TARDIS, and, of course, my sonic screwdriver. Oh, you cut out before the gag. Thank God. Oh, want to remind us what it was? No. Uh, oh, look, there are three settings. <laughs> <laughs> Joanna Lovely is a doctor, and Julia Suala is um, her companion. Um, you know, breaking the chronology of our interview for a moment, to jump ahead to where you are now, for someone so interested in breaking the rules, how come you've not cast a female doctor? How come I haven't? Yeah. Um, well, I have. That was Joanna Lumley. You heard her just well, there. Well, since you... Why didn't I? Why I, didn't I, you? Because I, I didn't not cast a woman. I cast a man. And in fairness, the decision to cast a man as the Doctor wasn't mine. It was Verity Lambert's. Yeah. I didn't do it because I wanted to cast Matt Smith and I wanted to cast Peter Capaldi. That was it. There wasn't... I didn't think it was a, a terrible idea. I just thought, that's not what I want to cast those people. That was it. When... Doctor Who was recommissioned in 2005. You were chosen by Russell T. Davis to be one of his key writers. And your first three scripts were all hugely popular. I and mean, I think it's worth mentioning them. The Empty Child took the Doctor and Rose on a gas mask journey back to the Blitz. The Girl in the Fireplace was a time travel love story for the 10th Doctor about Madame Pompadour. And Blink from 2007, widely regarded as one of the best ever episodes, chilled young viewers with the sight of the weeping angels, statues that moved when you closed your eyes. Here's a reminder. People don't understand time. It's not what you think it is. Then what is it? Complicated. Tell me. Very complicated. I'm clever and I'm listening. And don't patronise me because people have died and I'm not happy. Tell me. People assume that time is a strict progression of cause to effect. But actually, from a non-linear, non-subjective viewpoint, it's more like a big ball of wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey stuff. Yeah, I've seen this bit before. You said that sentence got away from you. It got away from me, yeah. Next thing you're going to say is, well, I can hear you. Well, I can hear you. This is impossible. No, it's brilliant. Uh, Carrie Mulligan as Sally Sparrow, Finley Robertson as Luke and David Tennant as The Doctor. Blink, originally broadcast almost exactly ten years ago, won several major awards, including two BAFTAs for your screenwriting and the prestigious Hugo Award for science fiction writing. Where did the idea come from? A graveyard in Dorset. I'm not making that up. Uh, there, was, uh, there was this family hotel we used to go and stay in in Dorset, and, and next to the hotel was a, an abandoned church <laughs> and a chained-up graveyard, obviously. There was these big gates, and there were chains across them, and there was a sign that said unsafe structure on it, uh, and that looked really great. And inside, if you look through the bars, you could see uh, toppled gravestones and overgrown rocks and all that. It was rather exciting. And in the middle of it all was uh, an angel with its face in its hands. Uh, and that image stuck with me. And so uh, sometime later when I was doing Blink, I came up with the Weeping Angel as that, as the statue that moved when you couldn't see it, the unsafe structure. And I kept the idea of the chained up gates. That's the very first shot in Blink, is the chained up gates. And uh, that was very successful. So a few years later, I took my son back. And when we were back at the hotel, I said, come and see the original Weeping Angel. And we went to the uh, abandoned church and the chained up graveyard. And there was no Weeping Angel there. It was gone. <gasps> <laughs> there are two possible explanations. <laughs> one is that weeping angels are real and nobody was watching that one long enough. And the other is I misremembered. Uh, but I can't figure that out now. Because I, 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 I think, I'm almost certain, please, if anyone can tell me where I got the idea from, write in and tell me. You know, there are two in the Glasgow necropolis. Are there? Yes. Is that where I got it from? It might have been. Uh, with face and hands, though. Yeah. That, might, well, that would make sense if it's there. I've never been able to find that out because every time I enter Weeping Angel or Crying Angel or Lamenting Angel into Google Images, I just get a bunch of bloody photographs from the show I wrote. <laughs> so maybe that's what it is. That would make sense if it was Glasgow. I'll go and look. I've got a photo because we went there. We said, look, there are some Weeping Angels. Really? Oh, picture. thank God so that's where I got it. It wasn't Dorset at all. Um, but, <laughs> but, you know, these three episodes... Um, what if they're not there now? <laughs> Let's go back together. And I'm find not out. going to look. <laughs> but 
The current series of Doctor Who is being widely acclaimed as one of the best um, since it was revived in yes, 2005. Said that. Um, <laughs> notably, the presence of Bill as the new yeah. companion. It is your last full series of showrunner. I know there's still is it? Christmas Am I gone? special to come. Oh no! But how do you feel about it? And I wonder if you know, conscious of this series and the fact that it is your last, it um, feels like you've really. Well, it's unfair to say up your game when you've been running it successfully for years, but people are really responding to it so positively. Um, no, it didn't change anything really that it was my last one because there's no feeling of that. I'm still working on the show right now. I'm, I'm, when I'm finished here, I'm going to go and do another draft of the Christmas special that we start shooting in a couple of weeks. So, no, it, it, there is no particular feeling about it being over. I mean, there will be once, it, once I'm wandering the streets looking for work. But well, up until that point, it's, it, it doesn't feel a, a particularly like an ending. You, of course, had a three-film deal with Spielberg, Steven Spielberg, who pursued you to work on Tintin films. Um, in the end, you worked on one. And you, you did leave to take over Doctor Who in 2009. L.A. to Cardiff. It's uh, that, that old career path. <laughs> um, was, it, was it an easy decision? Yes, it was an easy decision because I really really wanted to do Doctor Who. Uh, so I've got the distinction that uh, Steven Spielberg phoned my house to accept my resignation. How many people can say that? And he was so nice, he said, I think the world needs more Doctor Who. So I thought, oh, thank you. OK, <laughs> bye. <laughs> and that was the end of my LA career. <laughs> um, having come back to TV in Britain, then you co-created another big show, Sherlock, Arthur Conan Doyle's detective, but set in the modern day, starring Benedict Cumberbatch and Martin Freeman as Holmes and Watson, and co-written with Mark Gatiss, who also plays his brother, Mycroft. You're a doctor. In fact, you're an army doctor. Yes. <clears throat> Any good? Very good. Seen a lot of injuries then. Violent deaths. Mm. Yes. Bit of trouble too, I bet. Of course, yes. Enough for a lifetime, far too much. Want to see some more? Oh, God, yes. Um, an extract from A Study in Pink. Is that the first episode in 20... Yes, that's right, 2010. 2010. Um, it got a huge cult following now, globally. An audience of 70 million apparently watch it worldwide. What is it, do you think, about your version, working on it with Mark, that's well, captured so many people's imaginations? Well, first of all, Sherlock Holmes has been a hit for over a century, probably the biggest hit in fiction for over a century. So I think there's only a tiny portion of the credit goes to us. Uh, it's the, it's we've pre-existed us and will go on past us, and there's more than one version right now. So let's not overstate our contribution. I think we did uh, a good version of it. Now, what, what does it mean to do a good version of Sherlock Holmes? I think the, the, the most compelling version that was the most accurate was the Jeremy Brett version with Granada, superlative uh, version of Sherlock Holmes, and the most authentic one. But if you're going to do another good version, you can't just do that again. You've got to have your own take on it, your own your own spin on it. And ours was not for the first time. Other people have done this. We updated it. We made him a modern man. Uh, and I would argue, and Mark would argue, that that brings him closer to the audience in a way that the original readers of the Strand magazine were reading about a contemporary figure who, in theory, they could bump into in the street, whose address they could find. They could believe in him. By putting him in the modern day, we restored to the shows the feeling of immediacy, that he belonged in your world. You could look outside your window and see him, uh, which stopped him being, curiously enough, older. One of the things about making him a period piece is it, he be, he's always portrayed by actors in their 50s, whereas it's very clear from the stories he's much younger than that. Um, a more youthful exuberant Sherlock Holmes is closer to the original in a strange way than the more faithful adaptations. He's supposed to be a young, posh tearaway with his army doctor friend living in a scuzzy flat having stupid adventures instead of getting on with real life as opposed to two gentrified old country squires wobbling away by a fireside. I got a question sent in from a Mr M Gatiss who oh, asks... No. We've seen him on the wrong side of the law. He's even shot a man in cold blood. But what is the one thing Sherlock Holmes must never do? What's the one thing that must... Well, a hell of a time to ask, Mark, thanks. Uh, what, what must he never do? I don't think he's going to get married and settle down, but uh, I don't know. I wonder what Mr M Gatiss would say. We've always drawn a line, uh, and uh, up to date anyway, uh, that says we will never be clear... This is a weird one to say, but whether he's a virgin or not. 
<laughs> uh, he's called the Virgin by Moriarty, but we'll never be clear on that. So every time we get close to that, we, we get away from it. That, so that's, that feels to me like a line you can't cross. I have one last question before we open it to the audience. Um, and it is a question that keeps coming up, so I know that you thought about this, which is an accusation that sometimes in your treatment of women in your storytelling, there's a reliance on, on cliched characters. Um, and examples, I mean, Amy Pond as a strippogram coming onto the doctor before her wedding, Irene Adler and Sherlock as a naked dominatrix, a lot about women and marriage. So mm. and we should say, you know, we're speaking from the point of view of someone like Bill, who's being absolutely mm. um, adored. Do you, do you take on board, have you taken on board concern about the way women have often appeared in these shows, Sherlock and Doctor Who? I don't, well, I think I've been... Uh, how do I explain that? I've written far more female characters into Doctor Who uh, than male characters. If you just do the numbers, I have. There's Amy, Clara, Vastra, Jenny, River, Bill. Are they all the same? Is Bill Potts no, the same no. as Vastra? How is Osgood the same as Irene Adler? Are they the same? They don't seem the same to me. They seem different, or at least. I would say they seem as different as my male characters are, who, generally speaking, have cheekbones and rude jokes. But I, I wouldn't say that they were all the same, if that's the accusation, except that they are all women. Uh, the other one that I've heard is that the, their lives revolve around men. In both cases, their lives revolve around the central character of the show, because at the moment we meet them, that's where they are. You know, it, it, we can't say that... We, we follow Molly Hooper onto her next adventure in which Sherlock Holmes doesn't appear, unless you want the spin-off, in which case we'll do it. Um, we meet them as they meet our main character, and we lose sight of them as they leave our main character. That's not... So it's, it's, it's accurate in one sense to say their lives revolve around that uh, main character, but everybody in the show, John Watson's life revolves around Sherlock Holmes. The Brigadier's life revolves around the Doctor. I get very uneasy at having to defend this position, but could I point out, respectfully, if you're going to say I can't write female characters, can I add a caveat? I meet plenty of journalists who say they became journalists to be like Linda Day in Press Gang. So it could be say except Linda Day. Mm -hmm. If you go to Doctor Who convention, you'll see lots of women dressed up as River Song, Amy Pond, Clara Oswald, Vastra and Jenny, and I imagine already Bill Potts. Can we say, apart from those characters too, who are not only highly successful characters, but are characters who appeal specifically to women. Now, on the other hand, mounting that defence puts me on the wrong side of history, on the wrong side of the argument. I don't want... I think we do need better representation for female characters. I, I would think we need... God, we need to do better on diversity. God, we do. So I don't want to be the guy who's saying everything's all right and you've got no right to complain, when actually I think that making the complaint is the way forward, is the right thing to do. So me defending my record puts me as a fat white man saying everything's absolutely fine, settle down, darling. I don't want to be that. Um, at the same time, I think my record bears a reasonable amount of credit. Let's take some questions from the audience. Uh, how would you write the last episode of Doctor Who? Like, if you were to end it, what would you do with it? end it on a cliffhanger that forced them to bring it back. <laughs> I do not accept that there will ever be an ending. It will outlive you and me and everyone in this room. Characters like Doctor Who and Sherlock Holmes are huge. They're bigger than any writer or any particular version of them. Do you think in a thousand years people will be debating, as we do about Robin Hood, whether there was ever any basis in real life? <laughs> Oh, I do hope so. Oh, I love your brain. Oh, that's great. Oh, that's good. I, I, I hope so. Well, there are people who sort of kind of think Sherlock Holmes is real. I don't know if anyone is sufficiently barking mad to think that Doctor Who's a real person. Unless, of course, he is. And this is his cunning disguise. I would like to think so. I certainly think their legendary status is of that level. You know, they're both Robin Hood. They're both King Arthur. I think Doctor Who and Sherlock Holmes will go on forever in some form. And I think what's exciting about Doctor Who is Doctor Who is television's first great myth. 
and a myth that will simply not stop. There will be no last episode. <laughs> and there is still the odd um, original police phone boxes in places like Sheffield. So when you see one, if they're still there, mm. you know, you might wonder. Right, let's take those two at the back and then I'll come to this mm. side. Do you ever get stuck for ideas and what do you do if you're stuck? Are you a writer? Uh, I'm just wondering if you're asking that because you get Hoping stuck. Hoping to be. Hoping to be. Well, just pick up a pen, it's easy. Um, <laughs> I am never anything other than stuck. Honestly, the condition of being a writer is not writing, it's sitting there trying to have an idea that's good enough to write down. Uh, they call it, stupidly, writer's block. But really, it's good to be stuck. It's good to be unable to write. Because what's happening there is your brain is saying, that's not good enough. It's not good enough. So think of something else. That's your editor working in advance saying, nah, nah, rubbish, rubbish, rubbish. Your brain is always right when it says that. When you can't write, it's because you're telling yourself it's rubbish. Well, one day it'll say, OK, that one's OK. It doesn't happen very often. Because most of the ideas you have, I regret to inform you, as close to 100% as makes no difference, are rubbish. <laughs> but if you wait through all those terrible ideas, you might have a good one. You wade through the swamp of your own mediocrity to find something half decent. Can I just say, I believed in the Doctor longer than I believed in Father Christmas. Yeah. And, um, well, they're both real. <laughs> uh, was there ever a moment you thought you couldn't do it? Yes. I'd always wanted to write Doctor Who, obviously. And the very first time I sat down to actually write TARDIS in earnest, I suddenly realised I didn't have a clue what I was doing. I'd only written, as, as far as I could remember at that point, sitcoms for so long. I just thought, how does this work? But what was good about that was I'd become, I think, fairly expert in writing comedy. I knew how to construct things. Um, but here I was, forced back on just writing ability or skill or, no, these are stupid words, on hard graft. How do you make a scary moment? I remember thinking that, sitting in my office thinking, how do you do scary? I've never done scary. And I didn't have, a, as I do now, a sort of pre-packaged answer on the shelf that I can reach for. I had to invent something. How do, you, how do you make a fright? And I figured out that, I remember thinking about this, that frights are constructed like jokes. You've got to set up, a little bit more set up, but both setups are disguised as something else so that when you dive in with the punchline, with the uh, resolution of that, it comes as something both predictable and yet astonishing. I remember being quite intrigued how frights work like jokes. I think I was quite good at writing The Doctor because The Doctor, above all, is funny, but he has to explain the plot at some point. And being quite good at a comedy monologue means you can do that well. So, uh, yes, I did have a moment of thinking I couldn't do it, and it was one of the best feelings I ever had. Finally, then, you said you're going to start filming the Christmas special imminently. Can you give us any clues about what to expect? Uh, well, no, because uh, I'm sorry, because uh, <laughs> you haven't got to the end of the series yet, which ends on, I hope... Quite an unexpected note. You all know that the mighty Peter Capaldi will be bowing out, but we're going to do it slightly differently this time. And I've been working with Chris about how we do the changeover in a new way. So I'm not going to tell you what that is. I'm excited by it. I think it's going to work well. But it's not... Well, every regeneration is different, but we are playing it slightly differently this time. I think we've got a good idea, but I am not telling you what it is. It's worth a try. Sadly, that's all we have time for, but thank you to our audience here at Hay, and thank you so much to my guest, Stephen Moffat. Thank you. <laughs>